Oh, Bob, sit here. Put your hand. Put your hand is away. Oh, quick, Bob, sit here. Nora, sit here. Nora, sit here. You can sit over there. I don't want a repeat of that. It's on. It's on. Oh, I've got it that much place. Oh, it's on. It's on camera. You can only hear your voice, Shirley. I'm going to send Bob a copy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now, and at the hour of our death. Amen. Our Lady, Sita, pray for us. In the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we've come young regardless. Can I have a page, do you know? Just one of these. Okay. Right, so now tonight uh, we are on the fourth mm -hmm. chapter and it is purgatory before death, the night of the soul. The purgatory before death means <laughs> that we, it is possible to do our purgatory here on earth so that when we die we go straight to heaven. Um, so, and so but before, if we are going to do that, uh, we are going to have to be purified of every sin. Come Hello, in. Elders. Good night. Okay. Welcome back. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Come and sit down. Um, Hello. Hello, Chris. Okay, we're talking about, as I just said, we're purgatory before death or the night of the soul, and we're talking here about uh, this is really the chapter on death. It belongs to the chapter on death, and we are seeing how <coughs> it is possible to do our purgatory here on earth so that after we die we have no purgatory to undergo at all. Now, this has been talked about by, uh, treated by Tola. Tola is a man who is a German. I think he wrote a, a lovely spiritual books, Tola, T-A-U-L-E-R. Um, and by Louis de Blois, I don't know exactly who is Louis de Blois, but anyway, he's mentioned here, and I'll put the name for you, Louis de Blois, a Frenchman. And John of the Cross, I think we all know John of the Cross, and the Carmelite who reformed the Carmelite order with Saint Teresa. Now, Louis de Blois explaining the phrase which Tola uses, we, and what we were talking about before, if you remember, the depths of the soul, how deep the soul is. God made our soul so deep that he is the only being that can fill it. Um, talking about the depth of the soul speaks as follows. The substance of the soul cannot operate directly. And uh, what he's saying here, we already saw it before, but I'll remind you, we don't act through our substance, we act through powers, faculties that are given to us. So I don't understand through my soul, I understand through a power in my soul which is called my intellect. So there is my soul and then my intellect and then we have soul, intellect, which is in the soul and which is a power, power. And then we have the act of thinking. Um, now these three things are really distinct in me. What we are saying is that in God they are not. In God they are all one. God is his intellect. God is his thinking. God is his own ideas. God uh, is God and there, is no, there are no distinct things in God and no distinctions. Hello, Michael. Welcome back. Um, so this is what he says, you see, the substance of the soul cannot operate directly, it cannot feel, it cannot conceive, it cannot judge, love, will, except through faculties. In this it differs from the divine substance, which alone is pure and pure act. 
and hence is immediately operative of itself. God has no need of faculties by which to pass from potentiality to act. He is thought itself. He is love itself. God is like a flash of genius and love eternally subsistent. On the contrary, the human soul and the angel need faculties. They cannot know except by the faculty. Faculty means a power. The faculty of intelligence, they cannot will except by the faculty of will. Hence we cannot admit, following St. Thomas, that the essence of the soul has latent acts of knowledge and of love, acts which would not proceed from our faculties. What he's saying is, you see, we are limited beings, and God is an unlimited being. God is simple, not a simpleton, but simple. That means the opposite of complex. He is not a composite being. He is a simple being. In other words, there are no parts in God. Everything in God is God. And God's power is God. God's mercy is God. God's justice is God. God's thought is God. God's love is God. That's why we can say God is love. God is truth. God is goodness. You can't say that of you, can I, Chris? <laughs> you only have goodness. But God is it. But it is true that when in, in our most profound acts, it seems to us as if we don't even act to a power, but as if God touches the substance of our soul itself. And Saint uh, John of the Cross talks about divine touches, and that's what he means. Those very deep and profound uh, feelings uh, that seem rooted in the very substance of the soul in itself. And these acts are so deep and so profound. Uh, what sort of acts are you talking about? Well, the so touches deep. of God, like when God sort of touches you and purifies you or makes you say something. It's, they are supernatural acts, they are not natural acts. They come from God himself. They are touches that bring forth a mystic knowledge, not a natural knowledge, but a mysterious, supernatural knowledge, very elevated and intense act. And they are acts not sort of proceed from our nature, but from God himself, supernatural. Say if it is an act of love, well, it comes from infused love, love infused into my soul by God himself. So I didn't really produce it out of my nature, but God seems to be touching me and I feel the touch of God on me. And Saint John, you see Saint John of the Cross, it says here, St. John of the Cross, like Tola, speaks in the concrete and descriptive language of experimental psychology, not the ontologi ontological language and abstract language of rational psychology. So he's describing it. That's why he calls it a touch, you see. It's not really a touch, to speak reality, but that's how it feels. Since God is more intimate to the soul than its itself, since he, is, he preserves it in existence, he can touch and move it from within. He touches the very bottom of our faculties by a contact, not spatial, but spiritual, a dynamic and divine. I'll have to explain all this. God is more intimate to the soul than we are ourselves. What does that mean? It means that God <laughs> is, a, is more within me than I am within myself. In other words, it means that God in me is a bigger reality than I am myself. I can be destroyed, you can't destroy God. He's a bigger reality. He is, um, he is aware of me more than I am aware of myself. He can do things to me more than I can do to myself. He is a bigger reality and he wants my, my uh, salvation more than I want it myself. Um, he loves me more than I love myself. And that's true of everybody. God loves us more than we love ourselves. Sometimes we do silly things to ourselves. We put ourselves in some very precarious positions, don't we, by sinning. But God loves us more than we love ourselves. Um, and he can, because he's the author of our nature, 
uh, he preserves us in existence. That means without God, we are totally dependent on God for everything that we do. And uh, we wouldn't exist if God uh, were not exercising his power on us. If God wasn't present to us, we wouldn't even exist. Maureen there would just fizzle out of existence if God forgot her for one split second. She wouldn't die, she just wouldn't be. <laughs> you see, so we are that dependent on God. Now that's why we say he can touch and move us from within. Now how would a spirit touch? How would the, your holy guardian angel touch you? Mm -hmm. Yes, by moving. A spirit, you see, a spirit is not present in the way a body is present. Maureen is present here and we can say where she is. She's in Sydney, in Beverly Hills, in the community centre, so far distant from that wall and so far from there. That's the place she's in. But how do you do that with a spirit who hasn't got a body? He's not in spatial uh, dimensions, you see. He is, in a place, he is there where he is acting, that's all. A spirit is there where he is acting. And in, it is in, in consequence of that that we say that God is everywhere. Where is God? Remember the answer of the Catechism? God is everywhere. Now, he's not everywhere in the sense that he fills all space. <laughs> we know there's nothing in space, is there? But he is there in the sense that he is acting on everything, keeping it in existence. And if God were not acting on any place, that place wouldn't be. It wouldn't be a place. There wouldn't be space. There wouldn't be space. There wouldn't be anything. There wouldn't be anything. So you see, a God, uh, therefore God, that's why he says he can, he keeps us in existence and he can touch the very, bo touch the very bottom of our faculties, uh, a contact, not spatial, not in space, but it's a spiritual contact, a spiritual contact. God is acting on us in a spiritual way. We say it is a dynamic contact, <laughs> contact because it makes us do things. And it is supernatural, it is a divine, a divine contact. So only God, you see, we say that we can't move any up what else's will from within. We can't <coughs> put um, um, incentives in front of them or reasons why they should act this way or that way. But in other words, we can move them objectively. But we can't move their will. We actually, we have a sign. We say no one wills when he's unwilling to will. That's it. Uh, we know that the uh, martyrs, what happened to them? Well, they, wouldn't, they were threatened and all sorts of things, didn't they? But they didn't give in. They didn't move their will. But God can. That's why in the Psalms we say, uh, move my will to your decrees. God can. God can move us from within. Now, um, now he says, a comparison has often been made between our super superficial consciousness and the shell which envelops the body of a mollusk. Man too has his shell. That is routine habitudes of thinking, ways of thinking, willing, acting, attitudes which are the result of his egoism or his illusion or of his errors. Now, nothing of all this is in harmony with God. We have certain tendencies that we get from original sin, which are not good tendencies. For example, the tendency to chase pleasure continuously and without stop. The tendency to think of ourselves before we think of others. Um, that which is the principle of all our sinning. Uh, we have uh, ignorance in our will, in our mind, and therefore we go the wrong way. We have malice in our will, all these things. Nothing of all this is in harmony with God, hidden in the depths of our soul. This shell, this superficial consciousness must be broken before the soul can know what lies in its most profound depths. In other words, we must reach our own depths and see what is 
lying right down within us. Uh, this is a bit of what is true in this modern psychology today, which is the psychology of the self, where we have, where we are, where we are obsessed with ourselves, look into ourselves, look for ourselves, do what we like, uh, uh, doesn't matter what other people think, and that kind of thing. Uh, there is, there are half truths, and that's why they are so dangerous. The half truth is ever the blackest of lies. Um, so they are more dangerous because there is some truth in them. So we have to break this shell. That which breaks the shell is the trials, especially the trial which is called purgatory, and that one with purgatory before death. In other words, that trial is the last trial that we get before we die, and it is the trial that purifies our spirit, our soul. Yes. Okay? If we see, before we die, uh, if we, before we go to heaven, put it that way, or before we die, if we're not going to purgatory, we have to have our senses purified and our spirit, in other words, our intellect and our will purified. Um, and we're going to see what all that means. Um, the, now, so the trials, especially the trial which is called purgatory before death, are what breaks this shell. Um, a poor woman, mother of many children, suddenly loses her husband on whom the family depended. The soul of this poor woman suddenly reveals a great Christian. What, how, what, what revealed the great Christian? Uh, the occasion was the death of her husband. You see, so that trial brought the best in her, brought out that. In other words, she started practicing the virtues and becoming, by so doing, even becoming more virtuous, getting closer to God and so on. The father of, this is another example, the father of a family is captured and kept in a war prison for many years. So he's a prisoner of war. The family cannot have him and he cannot help them. The mother has to work. Now, if he is faithful, God bends towards him and reveals to him the grandeur of the Christian family for which he suffers. In other words, shows him how he suffered for all the Christians in the world, uh, means the church, and how his suffering is not wasted. And correspondingly, he will give the graces to his wife and children if they also accept the trial. We can see the same truth in a king robbed of his crown. In Louis the Sixteenth, say, the king of France, Louis the Sixteenth was the last king of France. Um, when I was at school, the nuns always used to say, tell us that he was practically a saint. Later on, I was told, no, he wasn't a saint. Now, here it's say, he was the, king, the last king of France. He was condemned to death and executed during the terror. That means during the French Revolution, when the terror was active, and they were getting rid of all the aristocracy in France, and France has never recovered from that. The church as well. Hmm? Yeah, getting rid of the church as well. The church as well, yes. Wasn't the monarchy still out there? Was oh, yes, it was. Yeah. Having lost his own kingdom, he came to see before death the grandeur of the kingdom of God. So God gives him a grace to die, a good death, to see that he lost the a temporal kingdom, but what is that compared to the kingdom of God? You see, we get these graces, so we cannot say that God leaves us and forgets about us. He gives us more than we give Him. All Europe at this moment is passing through this purifying trial, we hope so. <laughs> Please God that we may understand. Pain is, now this chapter is really a chapter of pain, on suffering, yeah. on purification, you see. So we have to explain this. Pain. Pain is in appearance the most useless of things. And pain in itself is not a good. It's an evil. Oh, no. That's why we all hate it and we don't like pain. Nevertheless, per accidents, pain is good. Um, it is the most useless of things, but you see, with the grace of God, it can become the most fruitful. Um, 
because it becomes fruitful by the grace of Christ, whose love rendered his sufferings on Calvary infinitely fruitful. So God can get good out of evil, and out of pain, he got the pain and the suffering of Christ, he got the redemption of the whole human race, everybody. Um, the Holy Father in Rome recently recalled the Congress of Catholic Physicians. He recalled to them the words of the French poet. I, uh, I don't know who the poet was. Man is an apprentice, pain, pain is his master. Nothing can be known except so far as man has suffered. You can take this in an in an other way, and as far as he's been impressed by something and know. Thus pain, suffered in a Christian manner, is most useful. I said before, I think it was in this class, that you know it is only the Catholic Church who has some explanation about pain. And that is why as we go into the um, more Unchristian religion, to the unchristian religion, you see people hate pain more and more. That's why, that's why we get things like euthanasia, for example, becoming popular, because it's this hatred of pain, and they don't want pain, and they can't see any use for it. We can only see use for it because we believe, we have the faith, and we believe that God can get good out of evil, and perhaps the last days, of somebody who is suffering great pain are the most meritorious days of his life. So they should be, and we don't want to deprive them of that. Um, but for people who don't believe, you see, pain is meaningless, and therefore they try to get rid of it at all costs. Um, and so, you know, we have these horrible doctrines now. Pain suffered in a Christian manner is most useful. Uh, and he explains that, you know, even in the physical order, pain can be useful because it, it makes us aware that something is wrong with us and we can go to a doctor and perhaps get it right before it's too late. Uh, but, so, and you know, if, if when I put my hand in the fire it didn't burn, I didn't feel pain, well, I could be burned to death, couldn't I, before I even woke up to the fact. So pain is got its use, um, but pain, um, moral pain is useful too because it makes us desire a life superior to that of sense. It makes us see that, you know, um, well, this life is not worth much. We better get a, a life where, you know, we're not so dependent on sense. Pain makes us desire God who alone can heal certain wounds of the heart, and who alone can fortify and remake the soul. So, you see, when we are in pain, no matter what kind of pain, physical or moral, we turn to God. That's why, that's why, that's why when people are, uh, times are good, people are bad. Because when times are good, they forget their God. When times are bad, if we, the oldies would remember here during the war, everybody's praying, aren't they, for the war to cease. When times are bad, we turn to God, and God knows that. Pain invites us to have recourse to him who alone can restore peace and give himself to us. You see, the thing is, could God have created us so that we would never suffer any pain? <coughs> yes. Yes, but he didn't want that kind of he didn't want to. You see, he, he wanted, he came on earth to suffer and die. And because through suffering and pain, he could get uh, merits and he could act, do such good acts that he couldn't do it without pain. You know, you have to overcome something for pain. Therefore, your act is more meritorious, not because of the pain, but because of your great act of will to overcome it. And so out of evil, God brings forth good. He could have created a world without it, but he didn't want that kind of world. Now, St. John Chrysostom says, and St. John Chrysostom is one of the early doctors of the church. He was called the golden mouth. Suffering in the present life is the remedy against pride, 
which will turn us astray. You see, right, sometimes we think we are marvelous and then we do something that humiliates us a bit. And it's painful, isn't it? But at least it teaches us not to be proud. It is a very big teacher, very great teacher. It is against vainglory and a remedy against ambition too. Through suffering, the power of God shines forth in weak men. Why? Because we see weak men bearing their afflictions like people who are better than those who are strong. Um, God picks the weak. He said that himself, didn't he? To show forth his powers. Little weak things like little St. Agnes, for example. Why was she only a 12, 12 year old? Yet they couldn't bend her will. Um, things like that show us the power of God, how marvelous God is. Um, suffering, where was I? Through suffering, the power of God shines forth in weak men who without his grace would not be able to bear their afflictions. Suffering, patience, manifests the goodness of him who is persecuted. Now, see, that's another thing. If we didn't have the ignominy of the, of the, uh, what do you call it? Persecute the persecutors, I suppose, persecute the martyrs. Um, but we wouldn't have the virtue of the martyrs, would we? And that's a very great virtue. It's the highest act of fortitude, the act of martyrdom. And without the persecution of the iniquity of those people, we wouldn't have the martyrs. But God, to God, one virtuous act is worth so much more than, you know, a little bit of pain. It doesn't matter, we, the reward is so great. Um, so we have, God shows us what he can do with little weak things. As I said, St. Agnes or St. Cecilia, she was another one, wasn't she? A young girl, um, she stood, stood there, firm and stable, she couldn't move her. Memory of the great sufferings of the saints leads us to support our own by imitating the saints. Finally, pain teaches us to distinguish false goods which pass away from true goods which last eternally because it makes us think. And we think, oh, well, this is going to pass away, but goods, some goods last eternally. Now, this is what St. John Chrysostom said. This is a quote from his telling us how good pain is. And we know that in the spiritual life, when people are uh, moved by the Holy Spirit and when they have reached the higher stages where they are doing the works of the Beatitudes, they welcome the pain and they want the pain and they pray for pain. And uh, that pain is not pure pain. They also get uh, joy with it because that's how God acts. But um, pain... Why? Why is that? Why? Why do we want pain? It seems so unreasonable for people who are not up at the, in, up to that stage. Uh, it's almost unbelievable, isn't it, that people should ask for suffering? Uh, but Teresa says to suffer or to die. If, if she's not suffering, it's not for free. Now, what what does that? Grace, yes. And why? Why do those grace do that? Christian grace. It's Christian grace. Our grace is grace caused by Christ, merited by Christ and caused by Christ, and every effect is like its cause. Remember this principle? Every effect is like its cause. Now, the grace that comes from Christ configures us to Christ. It gives us his moral physiognomy, not physical necessarily, but his moral physiognomy, makes us like him. And as Christ desired the cross, didn't he desire the cross when he came to the end of his life? And the more, the more, the closer he came to the end, the more he desired it. Well, it's the same, the same paradox almost is repeated in the saints. And, and then the funny thing is, that as Christ said, he who loses his life, will find it, will gain it, find it. 
And by doing that, they've gained everything. This is the Christian religion, you see. So, um, Holy Scripture says, we have here a few quotes from Holy Scripture. My son, reject not the correction of the Lord, and do not faint when thou art chastised by him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chastiseth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. In other words, it's like a parent who loves a child. If a parent lets the child do everything it likes, and the child might think, oh, well, mum or dad loves me very much, and I'm allowed to do what I like, the day will come when it says, well, mum and dad didn't love me very much. They let me do everything they should have corrected me. So God is correcting us all along by giving us some pain along the way. And the pain is the teacher. <laughs> it teaches us the lessons we all learn. <clears throat> so he is the good parent. My son, reject not the correction of the Lord. We must purify the depths of the soul. Our Lord says often, if any man will follow me, let, me deny, let him deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me, come after me. Um, so we have to take up our cross. Again, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth fruit, he will purge it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So he's pruning the branch that brings off fruit so that he can bring more fruit. This lesson is particularly necessary for those who by vocation must work not only for their own personal sanctification, but also for others. We can teach others this, the value of pain. Some people have to work only to save their own souls, but most of us have to work to save our souls and that of others, because we are not islands after all. Either we have to teach, or we, we, have, we are parents, or whatever. And we have to, uh, these souls to look after. So, this Saint Paul says, we are reviled and we bless. We are persecuted and we suffer. We are blasphemed and we entreat. So, Saint Paul, the greatest of all the, oh, well, I won't say the greatest of all the saints, but one of the greatest of the saints, um, he had a lot of suffering and also a lot of joy. So, God God's purifying action on the depths of the soul is most manifest in this purgatory before death. This last stage of our purification. You see, the first purification we come across is the purification of the senses, where our senses are purified. We have two purifications in the spiritual life. Um, we have the purification of the senses, first, um, and both of them we call them dark, dark nights, um, and here we, we come out of mortal sin, we are purifying our, our desires and our virtues and so on. Um, we are learning not to want just things that are useless, but to, to use the creatures of God as stepping stones for heaven, right? And then we have the second purification, is the purification of the soul, of the spirit. Well, the teaching is that, you see, the, myths, the mystical life or the spiritual life is for everybody. No one can say that's all right for the saints, I don't have to do that. We all have to get there. If we don't get purified here, we have to get purified in purgatory because nothing defiled enters heaven. Nothing defiled can stand in the sight of God. So, good night. So, um, we have to undergo this. This is the dark night of the senses. This is the dark night of the soul and this is the dark night of the senses this is for the sake of that in other words first we purify our senses here we get temptations against the flesh against pleasures 
against things that please us, uh, against comfort, we get temptations to chase comfort, money or material things. Here, when we purify the soul, uh, which are the greatest virtues, which are the virtues that make us saints? The theological virtues of faith, faith hope and charity. and charity. So here, we are purifying not the lower virtues, but those three virtues, faith, hope and charity, so that eventually our faith can be so pure that it has nothing of impurity in it. In other words, no muck in it. A clean faith, because pure means unmixed. It's not mixed with any dirt and or impurity. And pure faith <coughs> is when I believe simply because God said so. Uh, pure hope is when we hope simply because God is the omnipotent and the helper. He promised to help us and he can do so. So we trust in God. We don't trust in ourselves in any way at all. That's when hope is pure. Well, not when I hope to get to heaven because I've been to Mass every Sunday, but when I hope to get to heaven because Christ died for me and gained grace for me. So there we have uh, the purification of the spirit and purify our charity when our love for God becomes pure. St. Thomas has a lovely chapter on whether is it possible to have pure love of God. In other words, is it possible to love God not because he is a reward, not because we get to heaven, not because he gives us the beautiful vision, but because of what he is. Forgetting ourselves completely and loving God only. Yes, it is possible, you see, but it's very really hard to get there. Um, because we are, we're getters. <laughs> we're not givers all the time. And this is why we call this purgatory before death. This is purgatory before death. So, um, if we undergo this purification of the spirit, then we are ready for heaven and we are ready for what we call the spiritual marriage. And we can get to heaven without purgatory. Actually, that is, you could say, God's idea, that we should die and get to heaven immediately after death. Purgatory is like an afterthought. God thought, oh well, I'm not going to put them in hell just for, for venial sins. Uh, so they created purgatory as a place where we can uh, get rid of all the impurities in our life and make up for them, so all the penance we have to undergo. But uh, really, God's ideal is that we should die and go straight to heaven. Um, my own teacher used to say, don't aim at getting to purgatory, because if you miss, well, you miss. <laughs> <laughs> don't aim at getting high up in heaven, or if you miss, at least you get in purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, in other words, we must not we all right, defiled to enter heaven, um, because actually the doctrine of purgatory, or we will see later when we do purgatory, is uh, shows of force the mercy of God, because if there were no purgatory and nothing defiled enters heaven, we all end up in hell. So at least it's, it's, uh, it shows the mercy of God that uh, we can get to purgatory. Now, I, I will also say this, that purgatory is dogma, and no Catholic is free to deny the doctrine of purgatory. I know that Protestants don't believe in, in it, but uh, that doesn't matter, we can't deny it. Now, its goal is to purify the depths of our faculties, to take away from us, extirpate with iron and fire, all germs of death. During this purgatory, the soul merits. Now, where does merit stop? At death. We, have, we cannot merit after death. So, if we <laughs> undergo our purgatory here, we undergo it with merit. 
if we undergo our purgatory without the dead, we undergo it without merit. Uh, and that is why some people pray that they will uh, to be given the grace to undergo their purgatory here on earth. It's a very brave prayer because it will take a lot of, of suffering and I wouldn't advise anybody to do it without um, uh, some advice from a confessor or a spiritual director or somebody like that. But it, it has happened that people do pray to get to do their purgatory here on earth so that they can have the merit um, of the suffering. I was how did that how would that be? It would be physical and spiritual suffering. Yes. Mm. Yes. In other words that they pay for all their uh, you know, we have to undergo punishment for all our sins, temporal punishment, that they do it all here on earth uh, before they go to heaven and get merit for it. You see, and merit for others as well if they do, do more than they need. Um, but it is a very grave prayer. But nowadays, uh, there's, a, there's so much um, palliative care. I have a friend who's uh, died in the last couple of months. And um, his, most of his suffering is taken away with morphine. Oh, well, that's all right. You don't know what's going on in his mind, though. He's opposing God still. He's really, really at the moment, isn't it? Oh, well, that, that's all right to try to alleviate, alleviate pain. That is all right. Uh, obviously, we can leave it in the hands of God, but some people do suffer. Uh, you know, there are, that, that you can do that with uh, physical pain, but how do you alleviate mental pain or spiritual pain? That's a different thing, isn't it? And that, that is a, a deeper suffering, really. So, um, so now during this purgatory, charity is rooted more and more in the depths of the souls, and ends by destroying all unregulated love of self. You see, what original sin did, it made us love ourselves more than God, and it has left in us the remnants of original sin, which is the tendency to love ourselves more than God, to think, to put ourselves first. And this um, purification takes away that. Um, during this anticipated purgatory, the soul merits, whereas after death, the soul cannot merit. And during this purgatory, charity is rooted more and more in the depths of the soul and ends by destroying all unregulated love of self. So then it kills it. And then the soul loves God purely because it doesn't love God because of the reward it's getting, or because it's going to heaven, or because of anything else, but simply because God is God and loves him for his own sake. Um, now, St. John of the Cross says, in spite of its generosity, the soul cannot arrive at complete purification of itself. It cannot render itself entirely suited for the world of divine union and the perfection of love. So God himself must set his hand to work and purify the soul in his own way. And we have to let God do it. Um, so you see, there are passive purifications and active things. We can do things like, for example, what we call making a sacrifice, give up your knowledge for Lent and things like that. That's an active thing. But you can, God can send you trials which are none of your own making. They are, you accept them passively. Now, purification of the sense comes first. We are deprived of consolations which may have been useful for the moment, but which become an obstacle when we seek them for their own sake with a sort of spiritual gluttony. See, when we first start in the spiritual life, God gives us consolations and it gives us a bit of pleasure when we pray and comfort. But then he takes it away because what happens then? We tend to pray for the sake of the comfort. So we've got this great hunger for pleasure. So we're going for the comfort or for the, uh, the uh, pleasure that we get out of 
um, to pray. So God takes it away and we feel as if we have been left on us on ourselves by ourselves without God. Now these things can become um, these comforts and that can become an obstacle. So what does God do? He takes away those things, he takes away the pleasures of our imagination, he takes away even sometimes some friends that we knock around with when we're young. And God sees that these friends are not good for us. And so, you know, you, we drop that friendship. Somehow the friend is taken away and removed, gone to another country or to another town. That happens sometimes, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. And we feel very sorry and we're very upset, but it's for our own good. God does it because that particular friend wasn't good for us, you see. Um, the ensuing sense aridity leads us into a life much more disengaged from the senses, from the imagination, from reasoning. We begin to live by the gift of knowledge. Um, so, it gives us experimental and intuitive knowledge, first of earthly vanity, then of God's grandeur. So, through the gift of knowledge, you see, the gifts start to operate in us, and through the gift of knowledge, what does the gift of knowledge do? It's one of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Uh, no, wisdom is another gift. What does knowledge do? What kind of knowledge does it give me? All the, same, all the sciences? What do I know? Astronomy? <laughs> yeah, it, it's a knowledge of values. It makes us know the values of things, values of creatures, values of God, values of spiritual things. So it makes us see the nothingness of creature, creatures and the everythingness of God. We see that God is everything and we are nothing. So it makes us humble. It makes us humble and it makes us mourn for our sins, because we realize how God is everything. And the blessed are those who mourn for what is the reward of warning. They shall be comforted. So then God will give us comfort. But first we have to mourn. And mourning doesn't mean mourning for the dead. It, it means mourning for our sins. Well, for the dead, there are trials too. But mourning for our sins, mourning for the wrong things we have done. Now, uh, so you see, we begin to live by the gift of knowledge, which gives us an experimental, intuitive knowledge. First of earthly vanity, then of our God's grandeur. We begin with the gift of knowledge, the gift which works. Where is the gift of knowledge? In the intellect. In the intellect, that's right. In, it, in your intellect, it, 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 first it shows you that creatures are not worth chasing, not for their own sake, because they are here today and gone tomorrow. They are like pleasure. Pleasure is not worth saving uh, because it's not something enduring like happiness, you see. Pleasure is here, now, and gone later. <clears throat> so then he makes us realize what he is in himself. First the value of creatures, then the value of God, so to speak. He makes us look at him and realize his grandeur, realize what that God is everything, that we are entirely dependent on God for everything we do and think and say, and that God is not dependent on us at all, and that without him we would be nothing. Now temptations which become very frequent lead us to make meritorious acts, even heroic acts of chastity and patience. You see, we, be, we become tempted by things of the flesh. That's why he says chastity, patience, people who annoy us. We put up with those things. And sometimes temptations are so great that to overcome them, we need heroic acts of will, heroic sanctity. And therefore, we, it makes us heroic, because all the gifts make us either geniuses or heroes. All right. 
So uh, we are purified by losing certain friendships, by losing fortune, by undergoing sickness, by family trials, for example, in the case of a person unsuitably married, and so on. We know saints who have had unhappy marriages, don't we? That purified them and made them saints. We know saints who have had children who were not so good, and that, that suffering made them saints. This purifying of saints has as its goal to subject our superior faculties entirely to God. But, you see, in other, really, it subjects our senses to our intellect, and then our intellect and will are subjected to God, so that the whole person is subjected to God, bit by bit. You see, God, can God, can God sanctify somebody instantly? Yeah. Yes, but he doesn't normally, does he? <laughs> Very few of us just become saints, just like that. Uh, we know of one conversion, for example, St. Paul, on the road of Damascus, he saw the great light and, and then, uh, you know, he is um, sanctified. But normally, we have to undergo these purifications. It doesn't just happen like that. Um, what about those people who are converted on their deathbed? Well, they probably will have to undergo the more in purgatory, you see? Uh, because we do have to undergo them. We have to be pure before we get to heaven. Nothing defiled can enter heaven. So if it's not his, it's in purgatory. And Gary Goulagrange says it over and over again. Don't think that it is because there has been a doctrine in the church, a teaching, that it, it uh, mystical contemplation, and it wasn't, wasn't for everyone. That, you know, it was only the chosen few that God picked who were destined to gather Koda. But he's saying over and over again, that is wrong. Everybody has to undergo this. So now, all right, this beautiful, um, the saints of the, uh, the, sa the stains of the old man, says St. John of the Cross, persist in the spirit, though the soul itself may not be conscious of them. They yield and disappear only under the soap and lie of purification. You see, we can think that we are very smart and that we are very holy because we say our prayers or because we do certain acts that we think are very good. But, you see, there is a danger there that we think, well, I am so good, I don't need purification. And so we, so God has to show me um, where my defects are. You know, we're all blind to ourselves. I told you many times what the French proverb says, pride dies quarter of an hour after we're dead, a quarter of an hour after we're dead, that means, you know, <laughs> we have to get rid of it. Uh, and, and so God has to show us. And that's why sometimes God even allows us to fall into sin. So we see that, you know, I'm not that smart after all. I'm not that good. Um, even those far advanced often seek themselves unconsciously. We can do these things because it is so that 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 inclination to love ourselves left by original sin is very powerful. It's very strong in us. It's something in, in our nature. And so we can be seeking ourselves and not even realize that we are doing it. So God pulls us to attention. Okay, I hear. Look, look what you can do. Um, and this is how he purifies us. Some people, even these far advanced, can be much attached to their own judgment, to their particular manner of doing good. They are too sure of themselves. They might think because they give money to the poor or they visit hospitals, that's the only way to get to heaven. We get some people who think they're the only Catholics in the world or the only saints. They may be seduced by the demon who carries them to presumption. So we, what are the three things that pull us down, drag us down? The spirit, presumption. <laughs> yeah. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Right, so it's not always the devil, but sometimes it is the devil. 
And the devil, when he sees that we are making progress, he tries his best. Their faults can become incurable, being taken for perfections. Selfishness prevents them from seeing these faults. Uh, you see, so we can be blinded, in other words. And we are. We know that one of the sins of one of the wounds of original sin is ignorance. It's blindness, so intellectual blindness. So we don't see ourselves as we are. Hence, purification of the spirit is indispensable. It is a purgatory before death, meant to purify humility and the three theological virtues. Um, so the three theological virtues. Why do we put humility with them? Faith. It's going to purify faith, hope, charity, and we. He mentions humility. Why? Humility is one of the other virtues, isn't it? The moral virtues. But humility is such a necessary virtue that we cannot practice the other virtues without humility. Humility and magnanimity are like the two arches that support the building. We need them. We cannot get to heaven without them. Um, so this purification proceeds under an infused light, an illumination from the gift of knowledge, a light which seems obscure because it is too strong. Um, this light shows us the infinite grandeur of God, superior to all the ideas we ourselves can make. On the other hand, it shows us also our defectiveness, reveals in us deficiencies that of ourselves we would never find. So you see, sometimes the temptations that happen in those higher stages of the spiritual life, they just happen naturally. God is not causing them, but you see, through the light of knowledge, I see myself as I am. I see myself as being low down, filthy thing, full of sin. Um, having to undergo purification, punishment, suffering, and so on. But through the gift of knowledge, I also see how great God is. How he is the all-perfect being. He is everything. And I start to think, well, God is so holy, and I am so miserable, so low down, uh, filthy, dirty sort of a being. How is he ever going to forgive me? And I start to doubt his mercy. See, it, it, it happens naturally from just what we are seeing. And we can't, now we think, now it's silly to think that way. But it isn't because you see the saint, you read the saints, and they commit tiny little sins, which are not even sins, perhaps faults. And they are so sorry they have committed them. And they call themselves the greatest sinners. And you think, oh, yeah, I wish I were. <laughs> that, that, that's all my sins were. But um, they, they mean it. They're not pretending. They mean it because it, it, it's really, you know, if you're in a room where the sun is shining and there's a bit of dust on dark furniture, you see it, don't you? Whereas in, in the dark, you, you don't see it. So that's what happens. The saints are being illumined from above. They are illuminated, their mind is illuminated, and they are seeing both how small they are and how big God is. And that, and then, you know, it might lead to despair, or it, it might lead them to um, doubt um, the, um, the faith. Like, he gives an example here of St. Vincent de Paul, who uh, had very great temptations to doubt the faith. Um, or it might lead us to, um, oh, I don't know, I don't think it would lead you to hate God. But anyway, it can, you can have very, very great temptations there. Um, Paul says others have been scrupulous on, for years and years. And Francis the Sales, I think, says he's had his supper for scruples for years on end. Anyway. This light manifests more and more the infinite grandeur of God and 
superior to all the ideas I read that Hickel made. On the other hand, it shows us our defectiveness. Humility becomes genuine humility. The soul wishes to be nothing, wishes God to be all in all, wishes to be unknown and reputed as nothing. Temptations against the theological virtues common at this stage lead us to the highest heroism. So we become heroic by fighting those temptations. Uh, you see, when we fight the enemy, we win glory, don't we? Uh, and so when we fight, and if we win, then we become glorious. And this is why God gives us the fight. But with every fight, he gives us the issue. He, he doesn't tempt us beyond our means. We must remember that. God never tempts us beyond our means. We can never say the temptation was too great. I, I couldn't overcome it because God always gives the issue, always gives you the grace. Purification sets in uh, strong relief the formal uh, motive, however I read that. Um, now, it gives us the reasons why we believe, why we hope, and why we love God. Why we believe is because God is truth. Uh, why we hope is because God is omnipotent and he is willing to help us. And we love God because he is infinite goodness. These are the three stars of the first magnitude shining in this night of the Spirit. So in this night when we feel tempted, when we feel God has abandoned us, left us on our own, but he hasn't really, but we feel that way because we, we are, the temptations are so great. Nevertheless, we, if we fight the good fight and make use of the graces offered to us, then we come out victorious, covered in glory. St. Therese of the infant Jesus passed through this night in the last years of her, her life. St. Vincent de Paul, suffering for another priest tormented in his faith, was himself a saint for four years, I'll read you this because it's interesting, with temptations against the faith. They were so strong that he wrote a creed on a piece of parchment, which he pressed against his heart, every time the temptation became vehement, Every time he felt he was going to doubt anything in the creed, he pressed his foot against his heart and made an act of faith. And every time he made an act of faith, the next one was even better until his faith was purified. Who is this now? St. Vincent de Paul. Oh. St. Vincent de Paul was one of those saints, not so much one of those speculative ones, but one of those practical saints. But nevertheless, no, no saint is purely practical. I mean, he's, he's got his prayers and his contemplation, but he, he had this trial. St. Paul of the Cross, uh, sorry, these four years that St. Vincent de Paul spent in the dark night of faith multiplied his heroic acts a hundredfold. So whereas perhaps it took him 20 years to, to advance say, so many degrees in the spiritual life, then he did it all in four years or in a week he could do it. You see, we, we, are, we are traveling much faster as we approach the goal. We, are, we start off slowly and we accelerate. This is the natural principle, but it applies in the spiritual life too, in spiritual things. If I let this fall, it doesn't travel as fast when it's leaving my hand as when it's nearing the floor, doesn't it? It goes far, and this is what happens to us too in the spiritual life. Now, Saint Paul of the Cross, not Saint John of the Cross, Saint Paul of the Cross, he fashioned, he founded the pa Passionist. He endured a similar trial for forty-five years. This trial was meant chiefly to repair the sins of the world. Further, since he, he, he himself was already deeply purified and had arrived at the transforming union, he was thus prepared to be the founder of an order de devoted to reparation. So God prepared him that way. You see, God, can, these trials can last a year, or they can last 45 years. It depends. God knows, and he measures 
the medicine <laughs> according to the disease, I suppose, or what he wants from us. This passive purification of the spirit leads to mystic death. Now, what do we mean by mystic death? Here you are. We mean that dying to ourselves that Christ speaks about. We have to die to ourselves. He doesn't mean that we have to drop dead. Does he? Die to ourselves. This is this mystic death we are talking about. And it's the death of irregulated self-love, of spiritual pride, uh, the death of egoism, which is the principle of every sin. And it makes us see those things in us which we didn't see before, the little defects which we passed over before. It cleanses the depths of the will from all wicked roots. Now we love God purely, and because we love God purely, we love our neighbor, and we love him purely too. We don't love him for what we can get out of him. We love him because God loves him. And because by if he it turns out to be a good man, he will glorify God too. And that's what we are after, the glorification of God. So this is very, very uh, important. Um, and then it says here, according... Love of God and of neighbor now reigns without rival according to the supreme command. Which is the supreme command? The supreme commandment. Which one? No. The first one. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with thy whole heart and with thy whole soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind. And now that becomes what the saint is after and what he is doing. And therefore, when he is rich, he has reached this stage. He is going to merit with one act as much as he merited before by a hundred little acts. What does merit help? How does what increases merit in an act? Merit. When we when I do a good act. Right. Yeah, it's got to be a better act. A better act gets more merit than, than a, a lesser act, doesn't it? An act in itself, better, from its nature, better. What I mean is, praying is better than eating a meal, isn't it? So in itself, it's got more merit. What else? The right intention. Hmm? The right intention. Yes, the right. Do it with love. It, 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 love, love, more love, more love, more love. More motivated by charity. That's the big one. By charity. And more willingly done or willfully done. In other words, yeah. done freely. Freely. Uh, freely and with uh, you know without any reluctance. Now, this is the big one. So, when Our Lady did, does an act of love of God, and I do an act of love of God, who gets more merit? Our Lady. Our Lady, why? She's got more, more charity. charity. She's got more charity. And she puts all her charity in every act she does, because we know that Our Lady never did an imperfect act, did she? So if she had 100% or degrees of charity in her soul, she uses all that, the whole lot. I might have 20 degrees and I could use 10. What happens then? Versus Versus what do you call that act? Is it a bad act? No. Lesser. What is it? Lesser. It's an imperfect act, isn't it? You see, an act, an act can be act is either good or bad, and if it is good, it may be perfect or imperfect. So an imperfect act is a good act. What's an imperfect act? An imperfect act can be one in which, which I have a mixed motive 
for example, a mixed motive means that I don't do it only for God, not, but I do it for some other reason as well, because it's got some advantage to me, for me. That is an imperfect act, or perfect. Now, Our Lady put all the charity she had in all her acts, and therefore St. Thomas teaches that when you do that, you get the merit now. So if you have, if I do that, if I have 20 degrees of charity in my soul, and I do an act of using 20 degrees of charity, I get 21. You follow that? Immediately. But if I have 20 degrees of charity in my soul, and I do an act using only 10, do I get merit? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, but not that much. Not that much, and not now. It's stored for me in heaven. That's the point, that's the difficulty. So you see, that's why we are so mediocre, we're so many mediocre Catholics, because we never do our acts as well as we can for the sake of God. You see that there are degrees of charity. There is the degree of charity where we just avoid venial sin. We do things for the sake of God, but we're not very careful. And do things where we avoid mortal sin. And then when we do perfect, we do them perfectly as well as we can for the sake of God. So if I get, if I don't get my my increase of charity now, what's going to happen? I can never do a better act than 20 degrees. You see, because that's my best, that's all I can put in it. Well, if I get my increase now, next time I can do an act of 21 or 22, 23. I grow all the time. Now, Our Lady was growing all the time. Um, so, her act would be more motivated by charity. That is why all the spiritual masters say, the royal road to heaven is to do what we do as well as we can for the sake of God. Then we get our increase of merit now. And if we get it now, I can use it. You know, it's like if you have money in the bank. If you get your interest now, you can use it. But if it's there, you'll get it only in 50 years' time. It's not much good to you, is it? You have to have it now. And then you can put it back and get more interest on it, can't you? So this, this is uh, when we, our charity is pure, we make more progress in a week than we do it 10 years before. So you see, when we apply this to people who are on their deathbed, now if these people, even if they are unconscious, suppose somebody is dying and that person is unconscious, but how do we know that that person has not made an act of acceptance of whatever death God wants to give him sometime in his life? And therefore, his suffering is meritorious. We can't deprive them of all that. You see, this is a, a very a moral question of whether we can practice euthanasia. It's not mercy killing, because mercy killing is very deceiving. Uh, name for it. When, when we, our intentions do not need to be actual all the time to be meritorious. As long as you make an intention and you don't revoke it, it's still there. It's only if you revoke it. In other words, a virtual intention is still meritorious. Now, if, if a person has accepted um, or told God that he accepts everything God sends him, no matter what, even if he didn't specify, that person might be meriting more at that time than they ever merited before. See, suffering has got its value, and we, we mustn't forget that. So we do not need to be doing a, an actual, act, actual intention all the time to be meriting. A virtual intention, uh, that means we're thinking of something else, but we have made the intention one, provided it has not been revoked, is 
still valid, that still works. Would you revoke it, have us willingly, willfully? Oh well, some people might. If you revoke it, well then, it's finished. It's the same in the natural order. Mm -hmm. um, all right, now, um, Thus, the soul has passed through purgatory, if it undergoes all this, before physical death, and it has passed through in the state of merit, whereas in the other purgatory it doesn't merit. Thus, even here on earth, the soul is spiritualized, supernaturalized, down to its very depths, where all spiritual life begins and ends. So, the, the soul is absolutely pure now, washed clean, in the merits of Jesus Christ. Um, the soul aspires more and more to reach its source, to re-enter the bosom of the Father, that is the depths of God. It aspires more and more to see him, and to see him without medium. In other words, immediately, face to face. It experiences ever more keenly that only God can satisfy it. And it can be like Teresa on her deathbed, and she's done, she says, come on, it's time to go. And we go serenely and happily like that, it's time. Now, great saints exemplify St. Augustine's word, the love of God has reached the scorn of self. Uh, thus we read that the apostles, after their imprisonment, came forth rejoicing because they had been judged worthy to suffer opprobrium for the name of Jesus. You see that the, the saint rejoices that God has picked him to do something with him, to uh, suffer with him. And every day they sit not in the temple and from house to house to teach and preach Christ to Jesus. Their blood shed with that of thousands of other martyrs was the seed of Christianity. Because we know that the blood of martyrs is the seed of the church, yes, the Christians. Um, the love of God, even to the scorn of self, triumphed over, over selfishness, reaching to the scorn of God. Unselfish love of God converted the world, Roman and barbarian. And then he asks a question here before we finish, what will convert the world today? Repentance. What do we need? Um, and then Gary Goose's answer is only a constellation of saints can lead the masses back to Christ and the church. So what we need today is saints. saints. One saint. We know that at the canonization of the little flower, the Pope said that he had converted more people even than Francis Xavier who had come to the missions by her prayers and sufferings. Merits. So, you know, saints, we think they're doing nothing, perhaps locked up in their cell or whatever they are doing, but they are the powerhouse, all right, driving the world to God. The, uh, this is very interesting. This is, this is the, the, um, the judgment of a great theologian. He says, only a constellation of saints can lead the masses back to Christ and the church. Mere democratic aspirations, as conceived by Lamennais, Lamennais was a theologian, but anyway, many others are not sufficient. You see, they think that if we have dem democracy and all that, that will save the world. Or, in other words, not only that, but any political thing is not enough to save the world. It's not sufficient. No political theory, no matter how perfect it is, is going to save us. We need saints. There is need of the love of a Vincent de Paul if we would reach the depths of the modern soul. Everlasting life must again become not a mere word, but an experienced reality. So this is what we need today. We need saints more than we need scholars or scientists. But unfortunately, we think that science is going to save us, don't we? Science is going to save us and we've dropped heart because of that. And we, we, that's going back to paganism, making science of God. We need saints. Christ with 12 apostles converted the world, didn't he? And that's what we need, saints. 
Thank you very much. We'll carry on next week. If anybody is interested in some old Reader's Digest, somebody gave me a few here. If you want to do a bit of reading, short articles, come and get them. Thank you very much. We'll say our decade of the rosary and we'll remember all those people who are sick. And we have had so many apologies from people who are sick. And we'll still remember Charles, who we miss very much. He used to come every Friday night. Name of the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Uh, where are we? Is the fourth glorious mystery? Fourth glorious mystery. Um, yeah, uh, us, um, Assumption of Our Lady to Heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and it shall be world without end. Amen. Oh my God, Jesus, 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 our Lady Seat of Wisdom. Pray for us.